Now, unfortunately, there are people living on the streets who don't want help from the services that we have provided here in the Florida Keys. Key West definitely has a big city problem when it comes to homelessness. In fact, it has the highest percent homeless population of any city in the U.S. This morning, I'm going to be talking with the consultant who's been contracted by the city to come down here and eliminate this growing challenge. Robert, thank you so much for being on with me. Good this morning. morning. All right, Robert, I've been looking into your background and I was so impressed to find out that you actually did a lot of work with the homeless while you were working in the White House. Yes, ma'am. I've done I, about 30 years. I've been working in the homeless community mm -hmm. and I've worked from the White House and down to, to city halls and I was a former elected official myself. So I've had to deal with it mm -hmm. in my own community and we have found pretty successful ways of dealing with it. And so we're now taking around the country. All right. And tell me, Robert, you have been contracted by the city to look into our homeless problem here in Monroe County. Tell me about some of the things that you were able to find already. Well, you have all the normal problems uh, that any other homeless community has. And I would call anywhere where you have palm trees, golf courses, beautiful weather, you're always going to have a lot of homeless. And, that, and that's probably the biggest takeaway is weather is the number one reason why somebody moves to uh, a community in terms of homelessness. But what makes Key West very unique, there are three statistics that were candidly shocking and just really dramatic. One is you have the highest percent homeless anywhere in the United States. I mean, that's, you, you sort of said it almost casually. I mean, that's a huge deal. You have the highest percent homelessness anywhere in America, yet you're this little small island, uh, basically. Uh, the second is, which creates a problem when you start to work on this issue, is your, most of your folks are from somewhere else. You, you have about 98% of your homeless population from somewhere else. A normal southern city, San Diego, San Antonio, New Orleans, might have 40 to 45% local. You have under 2% local. And so that makes it, its destination homelessness, which creates a unique set of, of issues. And then finally, uh, which is really the saddest number, is your chronic percent homelessness. A normal community has 16 to 21% chronic homeless. You're, and that's defined as homeless for one year. You have homeless people here uh, according, and we know this by first name and last name, we've been able to track it by individual. So this is not an estimate, this is a real life number. You have over 50% homeless for 10 years. So you're, you're twice the number for 10 years that a normal city is for one year. Uh, you have 25%, almost 25% uh, for five years or more. And so whether it's the five year number, the 10 year number, it is huge compared to what other cities have for a one-year number. Now, Robert, there are you know people that are living on the streets who they just don't they don't want any help. We do offer services here, and I know something you found is that we actually contribute to the problem by offering services to those people who don't want help. And and that's the second. You know, weather brings them in, and then how a community enables or engages the homeless community is what whether you grow the homeless number or and get people. Uh, more to come to your city or you lower the number and you engage people into programming. You'll never arrest your way out. You know, the right wing always wants to try to arrest their way out. Mm -hmm. And then the left wing always wants to sort of overly enable on, on the other and feed in the park. Neither will reduce homelessness. How you reduce homelessness is getting into, so you have some really good local programs here. Mm -hmm. And it's through those programs that you get people to graduate from the street. So the key is to get people into programming. Mm -hmm. And candidly, Key West enables. Um, it, there, there's a lot of food that's given out that's not connected to programming. People give out, uh, you know, sort of panhandling cash out the window or on the street. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've never seen anywhere before in the United States is you all give out alcohol. And, and that would be, that's just crazy to be giving out alcohol to homeless folks, especially people who have addictive disorder issues. Right, yeah. And I know that people probably have good intentions with Absolutely the food and all good, of that. Yeah. You know, they're kind-hearted people, but they don't realize that what they're doing is increasing the number and not getting these people to the programs they need It actually to be hurts in. the individual. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's very well intended. It's mm -hmm. good-hearted. It's, it's coming from the right place. Mm -hmm. But if you do it in the wrong way, you actually can make things worse. I mean, you know, the media has a tendency to put, make me as I, one article said, tough love, Dr. Tough Love or something mm -hmm. like that. 
and to me, I call it smart love. It, let, let's have your heart match your brain and let's connect both. So let's do that good intention, but let's tie it to a service program. Tie it to one of your really good programs you have here in the community and that's how you help. But don't go feed in a park. Don't go feed under the bridge. Don't go take food out to the mangroves. That, is, that only makes the numbers worse. It may make you feel better, and that's important to understand. But, but that doesn't actually help the problem, and it doesn't help that individual. So align your feeding programs with other really well-run programs, mm -hmm. and that's how you actually still help. Mm -hmm. You're still doing the community service, but then that helps the overall community. Right. And now, Robert, I just spoke with a woman who graduated from the program at the Samuels House. She's actually working there right now as the administrative right. assistant. Right. Yeah, great Elmira. story. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's awesome. And, you know, these people can graduate from these programs. So, again, key is getting them to the Outreach Coalition, Samuels House, yeah. and the other programs. The, the Outreach Coalition, Samuels House, great programs. Absolutely outstanding. What Reverend Braddock does is mm -hmm. absolutely outstanding. But we need to funnel people into those programs. And, and those that's where success occurs. It doesn't occur in jail on one side and also it doesn't occur in the park on the other side. Great. And let's talk a little bit more about the solutions. You've mentioned get people into these programs. What else do we need to do to decrease this growing problem? I, I think there's sort of three things you can do real quickly. One is to change the culture. We talked a lot about that. Move from an enabling culture to an engaging culture. Doesn't mean you're not caring. In fact, it actually means you care more. You care smarter. And you, and you move from that enablement to, to an engagement and to get people into programs. So that's probably the most important thing the community can do. The second is there's a real need for a 24-7 facility for the folks that are first, first step right off the street. Uh, uh, HUD calls that a low demand shelter. You do not have one of those. And virtually every community in America has a low demand shelter. And, and you need to have that. That's a missing component you have. Right now you have an overnight program. That too, the way it's run now, actually becomes enabling because it's not a 24-7 program. That sort of becomes enabling. It allows somebody to come in and get sleep, but without getting engaged care. And so you need to have a 24-7 program where you, you have an, an alignment of the services, if you will. And then finally, there's some gr really good programs like the soup kitchen. You, you want a soup kitchen, that's a great program, SOS. But if the soup kitchen's feeding at four in the afternoon and opening its doors at 2.30, how's ever, is anybody ever gonna be working? How's people, mm -hmm. uh, individual gonna be in a program? So you wanna line that in such a way where that feeding occurs, but it occurs at five or six o'clock at night after mm -hmm. the work day or after the service day. Okay, and if we do these three things, Robert, will we see a decrease in homelessness immediately or will it take a while for results? It, it, you'll start to see improvement right away, but it'll take a while to really get it down to a successful number. Um, and again, partly because you have a higher chronic number than anybody in the country and you have the highest percent. Mm -hmm. But one of the most important things we need to do is stop the inflow. I, uh, mm -hmm. Some of the research indicates to me that you have one new homeless person here every day that arrives. That I mean, the, the COTS right now gets one new person every day. Right. That's who goes into there just to get a one-time help. That doesn't count the people in the mangroves or under the bridges or in the back alleys or by the cemetery. And so my guess is you probably actually get two to three new people a day. And if that is anywhere close to the truth uh, or accurate, we need to stop that inflow. So the, the one thing we can do right away is stop the inflow. Mm -hmm. And that's by immediately changing the culture. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. So you have to stop the inflow, and then it's going to take a while to case manage with the individuals who are already here. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we can do those steps, Robert. We can stop the inflow and stop us from being the city with the yeah. highest population, homeless population in, in the country. So. It, and, and you really have big city problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and you're a, ultimately you're a small city, yeah. you know, 25,000 uh, people, but your size of homeless chronic street population is bigger than cities than like Fort Worth. It's bigger mm -hmm. than what Dallas now has. So you have a very large problem uh, you know, with the small community. That's why the culture has to change first, and you mm -hmm. have to change that. And if you do that, then, uh, then every Reverend Braddock's program will start to even get better success rates. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully the 24-7 program will be up and running then, and you can start to get programming success in that. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on this morning yeah. and sharing everything that you've found so far.
from your time yeah. in Keyboard. So thanks for having me. All right, I'm going to take a quick break right now. There's more to come this morning, so stay with me.